All right. Hi, everyone, and welcome to this uh, show um, on epilepsy and, and daily life. And today we are so glad to be uh, having Neil Williamson joining us uh, from the UK. Um, Neil, you've been a pediatric nurse since 2000 and uh, maybe especially the last 10 years or so, um, also as an uh, epilepsy nurse specialist. Um, Maybe for our viewers, could you introduce yourself and what does actually your your job uh, as epilepsy nurse specialist uh, entail? Um, so yeah, so I've, I've been a children's nurse, a pediatric nurse for 20 years, mainly working in, in pediatric neurology and palliative care and epilepsy. So also Tourette syndrome. Um, so lots of children with complex needs. Um, so yeah, I'm the job that i do epilepsy nurse specialist epilepsy nurse um is specifically obviously working with people and young families with epilepsy um i've worked with people from zero so from birth up to 25 into adulthood now um so currently i'm i'm independent i have my own company with epilepsy nursing but i worked for the national health service for and charities various charities for the my whole career um I think the job of the epilepsy nurse specialist is really to um, give information, to be able to support families from diagnosis or suspected diagnosis of epilepsy. So when they first start to believe that there may be um, episodes that their young person is having, whether they be absent behavior, convulsive movements or unusual seizures, um, that from the moment they come to hospital or they interact with someone, that I'm there to help them to try to understand how to keep safe, um, what to do to improve the quality of life of their family and the child particularly, and the young person or adult, um, to offer um, expert information. There's an awful lot of misinformation in the world about epilepsy, um, and sometimes a lot of families in particular may have historical sort of cultural beliefs around the management of epilepsy. So the job is to give information to advise, to um, be able to answer questions in a meaningful way that help families to feel more capable of functioning at home. Um, when I started nursing, you know, people would come into the hospital to have their medication changed. So they would come into the hospital for two weeks to have sodium valproate put in and something, and that would just doesn't happen now. So the epilepsy nurse specialist is the person on the end of the phone, the person on the end of the email, the person who they can come and see at any time a bridge between the, the doctors in the team who are the epilepsy consultants and the families. So, you know, when you run out of medication on a Thursday, you ring your epilepsy nurse, <laughs> that tends to be <laughs> the way it goes. So yeah, so very much the kind of, I think that epilepsy nurses are one of those invisible types of people, you know, to people who don't know about the way that healthcare runs, nurse specialists, whether it be epilepsy, respiratory, are kind of invisible people and then once you have someone in your family who has a condition, they all of a sudden are very visible. Um, yeah. you know, because we're the person who, who does all the mopping up. When there are problems, we fix them or try to, um, at least we should. Um, and we're the first point of contact. So that's, yeah, that's kind of the job. And interacting with schools, interacting with workplaces, um, writing letters to make sure that people get the support they need, going to meetings, you know, multidisciplinary meetings um school meetings education meetings fighting the corner of our patients advocating um you know so having sometimes the discussion about disability discrimination or um you know um disability discrimination or yeah, they, yeah those kinds of those kinds of things really problem solving and you 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 touched upon it very briefly about suspected epilepsy um so in our community we are having a lot of families uh, affected by absence seizures but what would be your advice for parents who suspect their child to be having these um yeah very brief epileptic seizures uh, absence seizures i think what's really important about absent seizures um and bearing in mind that people use that word absence for lots of different types of seizures um there is the highest misdiagnosis rate in this type of seizure so the highest misdiagnosis rate is around 33 percent um, of children that have absent behavior um, that are misdiagnosed with epilepsy and put onto medication and i think that's why 
um, you know, the technology you've created is so important. I think what we would always say is that um, absences are all about context. So the, the truth is that if someone is having absent behavior when they are engaged in activities, you know, playing football or doing a, playing a game with their friends or, you know, um, at work in the middle of a task and they suddenly have absent behavior, um, that to us would be a very big red flag of saying, hey, this sounds like it could well be epileptic. Um, whereas actually we get lots of children who come to what we call our fits, faints and funny turns clinic, where we don't always say people have epilepsy. Um, and actually their parents are saying their geography teacher or their teachers at school are saying this child is absent during class. Um, but actually the parents are saying we're not seeing anything at home at all. Yeah. We, um, we're not worried. It's not something we've actually even thought about. None of his friends have said, his or her friends have said that. None of our family members have, have mentioned anything. And then you start to think, actually, is this really about the child's learning? Is it that actually they're just daydreaming? You know, that's often, or, indeed, that's yeah. often where it starts, isn't it? Or, or even... Um, even sometimes it goes as far as, as yeah claiming it's autism or autistic behavior uh, but definitely um, the role of the teachers uh, become very important in this uh, and they are indeed often the ones who are picking up on this suspected behavior um, yeah I think there's a nuance here I think that's exactly right I think there's there's two sides of this one side is you are having absence epileptic seizures and no one's noticing and your schoolwork is failing, and that's a problem. And I think that's so important that teachers that work or teaching staff that work with children are completely switched on to each of the children they support to know what's normal for them. So what we would always be looking for in a child with absence epilepsy is if they've been quite good at school, you know, they're doing quite well, they're along the top, and all of a sudden there's a big dip. We would always be saying, this looks like something if, if people are starting to say that there's absent behavior at the same time that they've started to fail at school we'd be saying that seems very indicative because when someone's having multiple absent seizures a day they're not at school they're gone somewhere else and so we would often see that link so we're always asking about education we're always asking about how things are going but to make your point um you know some children just do not do well in the classroom um, and that might be because they have epilepsy and it's undiagnosed, but it may well be because they're not engaged in school. They're not great um, learners in that environment. There's too many children in the class. It could be neurodevelopmental. It could be autism. It could be ADHD. Yeah. It's very know, easy. Deficits, learning disabilities, yeah. learning difficulties, dyslexia. But I think, you know, we do get a lot of uh, referrals that start with the GP, the general practitioner, the community doctor saying, the parents have come to me, the school have said they believe the child is having absences. Can you please see this child and diagnose what's going on? Um, I think what we're lucky with, with uh, generalized absence seizures, so absence seizures, epilepsy seizures that affect both sides of the brain, is that actually it's quite easy to elicit an absence during an EEG test. Um, you can cause, you know, by hyperventilating, so getting the child to blow onto a windmill, or an adult to hyperventilate for three minutes. Um, you can normally bring on an absent seizure. Um, and therefore, once you can capture what they call a three second polyspike wave on an EEG, then you can actually prove that it's epileptic. And that is extremely important. So a lot of neurologists within the National Health Service who work in epilepsy would say, unless I've got a positive EEG with a three second polyspike wave absence, I am not going to diagnose that condition because of the risk of misdiagnosis. So I think that's one thing you've got going for you in a, in a positive way is that you can normally um, diagnose that from EEG. However, it's important to understand that there are people that EEGs do not show positively, that have atypical absences, unusual absent type behavior or different types of epilepsy. So, um, so I think it's really important that a very good epilepsy team or a good neurological team or a good pediatric team sees that child and understands what they're looking for. On the flip of that, I think it's really important that teaching staff, families are engaged in know, knowing what they're looking for and what's appropriate. Um, 
you know, you can you can mostly because of the context of what they're doing, make out whether they're daydreaming or having absence. So, and I think the I do a lot of epilepsy teaching, and I think that one of the things that I see most commonly in the field of absence seizures that is um, important to educate people about is that. People that have generalized absences, you know, we know, don't we, that those seizures are quite stereotyped, that they last between 20 and 30 seconds, that they don't often come with other behaviors beyond loss of awareness. Um, within atypical absences, you might get hand movements, you might get excessive blinking or twitching of the face or other automatisms, you know, kind of fumbling and these kinds of things. But mainly on the whole, absence seizures come as loss of awareness, but someone will stay focused. One of the things that I have to teach a lot of people about is that a lot of people call focal seizures, the seizures that come from part of the brain where there is a loss of awareness, people call those absences. And I think it's really important that we use correct language. And certainly within uh, the UK, um, that we separate out focal epilepsy and generalized absence seizures. The reason for that is that generalized absences um, as much as they are, of course, important to recognise, they have a massive impact on learning, and they can be dangerous. You know, if you if you have an absence as you're walking across the street, that could be very dangerous. Um, but the key thing is, is that focal seizures have the risk of prolonging and becoming something else, and that means your first aid would be very different. You would be going and sitting with that person, being with that person, and watching them. Whereas with someone having an absence, if you're in a classroom, for instance. Yes, you want to keep an eye on them, and yes, you want to reorientate them to what they're doing. But actually, they we know they're quite safe if they're sat in a chair. You know, they're not going to have a convulsion. They're not going to go on and have a bigger seizure. Um, so the key thing is about actually about reorientating them to what they're doing rather than worrying about ambulances or do I need to phone these people. So I think one of the important things is for people to understand the difference between what's a generalized absence or what is an absence seizure what would be clinically diagnosed or what's a focal seizure which has the risk of becoming a different yeah because you often yeah you can also have these focal onset impaired awareness seizures that then might look very much like an absence seizure but they are typically longer in length and and they might indeed generalize into a tonic-clonic seizure so it could be like an how to say an, an warning sign that that something may uh, may take place uh, very shortly so does that also mean that um, in order for parents to be able to describe possibly differences between these two, um, how important are then uh, writing things down, but also capturing videos of, of the seizures? How, how important are those for, for yeah, the doctor or the nurse to, to, to understand more? I think, one, to be honest, the, the largest piece of technological advancement beyond obviously the world of epilepsy monitoring is that the mobile phone the smartphone with the ability to video record anywhere you go i mean when i grew up we all had camcorders you know you had to hold them like this or have them on your shoulder even with vhs tapes in so you know <laughs> so far back i go but the key thing is that you know people most people now have a smartphone and on that smartphone is the ability to record and i would argue that any epileptologist any epilepsy neurologist and even you know pediatricians with, a, with an interest in epilepsy epilepsy nurses who have done it for a long time could look at a video of a child having a seizure or, or anyone having a seizure and they would probably be able to give a relatively close diagnosis in most cases to what is going on whether it is epileptic or not well what type of seizure it is so frankly yes recording on video if you can capture it and again with absences that's quite hard because if they're short 20 30 seconds it can be very difficult to capture those because by the time you've got the phone out and you've done what you're doing um but often they are very frequent and so catching one should be relatively possible even if it's only five or ten seconds um and i think that actually when we talk about recording seizures so keeping a seizure diary is an essential part of having uh, looking after and supporting people that have epilepsy, um, just writing down in very plain language. So you don't need to use absence, atonic, tonic, clonic. These terms are medical terms and they're useful to us, but not really to people who are writing them down. One person's absence seizure is another person's focal seizure with a loss of awareness, as we've just talked about. So the key thing is to write down in the language that you would use plain 
Um, I'll call it English because I speak English, but plain language in, in your own written language and basically writing out what happens. And any doctor is going to say that is better than someone writing tonic, clonic, absence, focal. It's much better to just say. We had a child come into the A&E department once who had been uh, had a seizure on the way to school. The a, a person had been walking down the street, a first aider, and they um, supported the person. And they said to the ambulance crew when they arrived, this person has just had a tonic clonic seizure. So the ambulance crew brought them into our A&E department accident emergency room and said, this child, this young person has had a tonic clonic seizure. Now, when we actually did the further investigation and test, they actually had focal epilepsy and they'd had a focal convulsion on one side of their body. But that first aider only knew those terms, tonic clonic. And so therefore, it went from the person to the ambulance crew, to the A&E department, to the consultant, that this was a tonic clonic seizure. And so I think that's exactly what I'm talking about. It's much better to write it down exactly as you see it. So recording is essential. When you go to an appointment to see a doctor, you have to think that person is going to spend 20 minutes, an hour with you. You need to make sure that every question you want to ask is written down. Every seizure that you've seen has been written down. Every seizure you can record is recorded because you will come out with better care from that. In the end, the hardest appointments we have are appointments where, of course, family life is very busy. Um, life's very stressful and busy and people have got lots to think about. But people come in and they don't, you sort of say, how many seizures have there been in the last two months? And people say, um, uh, there's been, uh, there was one last Tuesday. Um, uh, it's much better to spend a little bit of preparation time and just write it all down, even if you do need to go back in your memory and write it down. Because then you, I find a lot of families say to me, once you get in the room with the doctor, your brain, your mind goes blank. And you just forget what you wanted to say and what you wanted to ask. And once you're out of your appointment, you suddenly think, oh, I meant to ask this. I meant to ask that. So the best thing is to prepare. Have a sheet written down. To be honest, one of my patients came in who had absence epilepsy, and he had written down a list of questions, and he handed them to the neurologist. And the neurologist said, this is brilliant. You are the first child who has ever brought me a list of questions that you want answered. And she said, that is so helpful for me. And she answered every single question that boy had. So I think it's so important to bring, yeah, exactly as you said, bring that information with you, definitely. And of course, when we take this one step further, so when a diagnosis has um, has been made, mm-hmm. and obviously um, the child or the person having the seizures might be on medication, obviously the the seizure diary becomes important then as well, but in a slightly different way, doesn't it? Yeah, definitely. I think that. You know, if you ask any um, epilepsy professional what they want from from people coming to a follow up appointment. So, as you say, once that diagnosis is made, they want to know really three things. One, are the seizures less? Are there less seizures? Two, are the seizures shorter? So if they are still happening, are they shorter? Are they less intrusive? Are they less um problematic in the functioning so i.e you know if a child was having seizures that lasted two minutes before are they now 30 seconds long instead or are they now longer are they three minutes or four minutes um if someone's on emergency medicine how often are you using the emergency medicine because again that's another cornerstone of what people want to know how much midazolam or you know diazepam or clobazam are you using because that's another indicator of of improving epilepsy so we want to know reduction of seizures ideally if there's more seizures we know we're getting something wrong b you know uh what how much emergency medication if you have it are you using bearing in mind that people with absence seizures do not uh have it often and then thirdly uh, is the recovery time shorter so thirdly if you do have a postictal state after seizures is that shorter and that's often a very good indicator of of improving quality of life because um for instance my my best friend in the world his mum has terrible temporal lobe epilepsy she has multiple seizures a day and she has a vagal nerve stimulator and multiple medication and she used to have three or four minute seizures um and often she would have about 10 seizures a day and still does the difference between the vns and not having the vagal nerve stimulator was that the seizures went no different still 10 a day but they went from being four minutes to 30 seconds 
and and the post ictal state the recovery phase went from being half an hour to five minutes and that meant that she could go back to work and that's the difference so it's not always about getting rid of all the seizures um sometimes that's not possible it's sometimes about making sure that the seizures are less intrusive so as we as you asked we want how many seizures have there been if there's a recovery period how long does that take um, and thirdly, how much emergency medicine? And then the fourth and fifth things you want are, where do the seizures happen? Are they always happening in the same place? Because then you can start to build a picture of what might be going on. So we've had children that have only ever had seizures in the computer room at school. And actually, it's not the computers, but it's the temperature of the room. It's either hotter or colder. Um, and that means we can then put things in place to improve that. Um, is the child hungry? I've had children who are fed by gastrostomy with complex needs, by feeding tubes, who literally aren't getting their feeds on time and then they're having seizures. And once you correct that, it improves and there are no more seizures. So we want to know where the seizures are. Are they always in one place or are they all over the place? Are they daytime? Are they nighttime? So therefore, are there any obvious triggers? So that's all part of trying to get information to us. Those are the main things that a seizure diary will give us. Definitely. That's some very, very good uh, tips. Um, and have you experienced any change during COVID in the way that uh, follow up with the families have uh, yeah, has taken place? Um, yeah, no, definitely. I mean, for epilepsy, I suppose the, the key thing is uh, one, with a new patient, um, you often want to examine them. You need to examine them to make sure you're looking for particular things physically, doing a neurological exam, um, looking for the cornerstones of things like tubular sclerosis, you know, using um, various tests to look at their skin, etc. So that's essential. And, and so I think that um, at the moment, seeing new patients is maybe more challenging for the team. I think you have to sort of do face to face there. But I think most of our follow ups have been changed to video or telephone. Um, and I think that's OK. I think you can live like that for a while. I think that, um, you know, you can still ask about the seizures, of course, over telephone or video. You can still um, answer questions from the family. You can still change medications. We can do prescriptions by community. Um, our clinic letters that are written from our clinic appointments are the things that go to the, the general practitioner, the local doctor, who will then prescribe the medications. Um, you know, we can also send prescriptions out uh, to be filled by pharmacies. So that's easier. I mean, doing the follow ups is easier. However, um, you know, I personally feel there's a necessary face to face contact. I don't think that I think a lot of people have been talking about whether this will change the nature of how we do our jobs in epilepsy going forward. Will we just be doing phone follow ups and video follow ups? Um, and I think that that's a very good idea in some ways. It will certainly make us more efficient. And I think for families, it's often easier than having to come into the hospital. Children often have to miss school, those kinds of things to come into appointments where actually the child doesn't always necessarily have a lot to do, depending on their age and development. Um, but often it's the children, I think, with more complex needs, the children with more complex disabilities that I feel need more support. Um, and maybe actually sometimes face to face clinics in schools with them are very helpful. And they're the things that have been missed out on during COVID-19. I think COVID-19 has created that that wall between us all. Um, and we can live with with that wall for a little while. I think we can definitely contact people. People can contact us. But I think sooner or later, you will require face to face. I think there's nothing quite like actually physically meeting someone. Sometimes um, a lot of our questioning comes from reading body language or from seeing how a person's responding, um, you know, and, and seeing the child and making sure. So there's also issues about observing behavior. So often for us, observing behavior in clinic is very important. If we have a child who comes into our clinic room and we're talking to the parent and their behavior is um, very obviously challenging, then that's very helpful for us to know. Because sometimes families maybe aren't aware of it or aren't as forthcoming about wanting to discuss those issues or don't feel those issues are necessary for us to know about. Um, so, yeah, so I think whether we maybe hit a point later where we do maybe every other follow up by video and telephone and one follow up by face to face or, you know, I think it, but everyone, everyone in the epilepsy world, all the epilepsy nurses have been working from home or working in their office. 
um, visiting the wards less, um, going into the hospital less. And so I think it does create um, uh, a barrier, but I think epilepsy is probably one of the easier conditions to do it with because a lot of our work is about questions and talking as opposed to respiratory clinics, for instance, which require clinical tests every time the, the young person comes to a clinic. Yeah. So, yeah. And talking about that, that contact and coming together, obviously, um, between families as well, it's very important. And once they are affected with epilepsy, they can share uh, their experiences with each other. Um, I know you are working with Hope uh, for Pediatric Epilepsy in London. Can you maybe explain what, what this um, group is doing and the importance of, of yeah, joining yeah. Their, their forces? Uh, Definitely. So. So Hope for Epilepsy London is relatively, in the UK, a relatively unique thing. It's a relatively rare thing of having, it was set up by a parent of a child that has a condition called Dravet syndrome, sodium channel 1A um, epilepsy. Um, and, um, and it was set up really to bring parents and children together as a way to just set up. So it's, it's in a, a special educational needs school, so in a disability school. Um, we rent the place and every one Sunday a month, we all meet together um, or people meet together and we run sessions. So they use the play equipment, you know, the soft play areas, the playground. We have sessions. We do cinema. You know, we watch films. We do cake making or pizza making or whatever it is. Um, and really, you know, the, the children do the activities and play and have fun because that's what kids do. And the parents have a cup of tea or a coffee and they have a chat. And I think that's where the power comes from is that I think most people that live with a child that has a complex medical problem or, or any kind of medical problem, talking to other families that have lived through it, who maybe are either at a later stage. So for instance, a lot of those people that have teenagers are very good at talking to the people that have younger children because the people with younger children are asking, how do I do this? What do I need to do? Give me the hints and tips. My favorite experience ever, I was at Disneyland Paris with, uh, with some families on a trip. And um, I had two parents in front of me, both their children had cerebral palsy and one had a 15 year old and one had a four year old. And the four year old lady said, I'm really sorry, I've got to get my notebook out and start taking notes because what you're telling me is so helpful. Um, so you can't underestimate the power of families coming together. It's so important. Um, it makes them feel that they're not alone it makes them feel less isolated it gives them great information from other families who have lived through things the realities i can tell you all day long what it's like to have a child with epilepsy but i think it's much better coming from a parent who's lived through it who's had to get up at nine times in the night to manage their child's seizures who doesn't sleep um who's had to manage other siblings alongside the child with epilepsy go to multiple appointments etc pick the right school i think that's what you can't um, separate. So that's what hope is. And we do trips out. We go to theme parks and we do that kind of stuff. And we have a Christmas party, you know, um, and we, we celebrate different festivals, different faiths and all that kind of stuff. So um, but what we've been doing during COVID is we've done some some web sessions. So I did one yesterday um, for an hour, which was basically just a and a with an epilepsy nurse. So anything people wanted to come on and ask, um, we just did an hour of just this is my question um well one of our um he's a young adult uh, expert so he works in the field of transitioning young people from children to adult services he did one the week before um he works for a charity called young epilepsy in the uk which is a very big charity um and um next week we've got someone talking about the ketogenic diet who's who runs matthew's friends that's a very well-known national ketogenic charity then i'm doing one on first aid and seizures how to manage seizures so we're kind of still trying to branch out. We've had to stop our sessions for the time being. Um, again, that felt like the right thing to do, you know, thinking about priorities and thinking about the client group we're with. Some of those children are very vulnerable and shielding. Um, so we have shielding in the UK for anyone who's extremely vulnerable. But I think also it's important to say that most children with epilepsy aren't in the vulnerable group or the shielded group. I think Often we're, when we're looking at shielding and vulnerable groups, we're talking about people that have poor respiratory health and have maybe uh, mobility needs. So very physically disabled people, um, you know, so it's also important to balance mental health 
So, you know, children need to be going out and, and need to be getting some exercise and doing what they normally do as close as possible. So I think the plan will be to try and reinstigate hope in the autumn, probably. We normally have a break yeah. in July and August anyway for summer holidays because actually people are away. And so hopefully we'll be back on it in September doing what we do. Um, but I think, you know, families can email us. Families can ask questions. We have a website where you can ask questions. We have lots of resources on the website. So basically, we're just a hub somewhere where families can come to us and say, I have these questions. So we've had families come for one session just to speak to me, for instance, or they've come just to meet us and then gone again. Other families that come every month, other families that dip in and out when they can. Um, you know, some people that just want some questions answered and, and that's it. So, you know, um, it's we just try and be whatever people need us to be, <laughs> basically. Basically. That sounds fantastic. Maybe as a final note, uh, and with the summer in front of us, do you have any advice uh, for families with children with epilepsy on how to approach the summer, uh, things they should keep in mind if they go for longer trips or so? Definitely. I think the key things during warm weather, dehydration is a massively untalked about trigger of seizures. Well hydrated, uh, which is hard when all the toilets are in the public are closed but, because people need to go for a wee. But the key thing is lots of lots of fluids, um, hats, sunshades, you know, making sure you're not out in the sun in the heat of the day between normally between midday and two o'clock in the afternoon. Um, making sure that people are eating well, especially when they're running around, having a great time. Be mindful in the water, you know, whether it be a swimming pool, whether it be a beach, just be aware of what your child's able to do or what the person's able to do, what's safe for them and what isn't. Um, on terms of going away on holidays or going on trips away, you know, it's always good to know where the local hospital is if your child does have prolonged seizures and you have emergency medications, um, or to know where local doctor services are if, if your child becomes unwell, um, and sort of where you are really, where the nearest hospital would be, you know, make sure you've, you've done your research as to where you'll get help if you need it. So if you're suddenly in a cabin in the woods, it's probably good to know what is the ambulance response time to this cabin in the woods. You know, I live in inner city London, so I can get an ambulance to me in eight minutes. But that's very different if I travel to our Lake District, where it might be 30 minutes for an ambulance. And that might change the nature of when you phone an ambulance during seizures. Um, but I think overwhelmingly, you know, have fun. If you're going to do activities, just have a chat with the people who run those activities. If you're doing an organized activity and say, hey, my child has this type of epilepsy, what what would you suggest? What do we need to do? Is it possible for my child to come? But also don't be put off by people who maybe don't know about it. Um, you know, so laser tag is a really good example of this. You know, people say, oh, you can't come in. You've got epilepsy. But actually, my child's not photosensitive epileptic, and that's the danger in laser tag. So they can come in. It's the you need more education around around epilepsy. You need to know more about it. So, you know, I think it's really important to understand your child's epilepsy or the person's epilepsy you're managing so you can advocate for them to be able to do the things they should be able to do, um, as well as making sure they're safe doing what they're doing. But the main thing is, you know, um, everyone needs to have a good time. You know, mental wellness in epilepsy is massively important. Um, the rate of mental health, 40% of people with epilepsy have a mental health problems. So the more fun you can go and have, go and do it. Get out as much yeah. as you can and have a good time within the boundaries of what's safe at the moment. Thank you. Well, that's really great. Uh, it's a very nice way to, to come to a close to this. Uh, the, the summer has come and, and people should be able to enjoy, but take their precautions. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. So, Neil, uh, thank you once again for joining us. It has been very, very uh, informative and nice speaking with you. I'm sure the community will, will benefit uh, from watching this video and uh, picking up the tips and the tricks, uh, depending on where they are in the epilepsy journey. Um, so, Thanks again for your time, and I wish you a very, very pleasant summer. It was an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much.